Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Custom Magic, where the cards are made up and the colors don't matter. I am your host, Mikio. Joining me today, as always, is Noki, as well as two new guests. Hello, Hello. I'm uh, Ruben Covington. Uh, I used to run the Remaking Magic uh, podcast, and I'm a uh, designer and uh, programmer for Lightmare Studios. Hello there, I'm Mr. Bones. Uh, I'm a friend of Mickey's. I've been playing Magic for a good few years now. I recently got back into it in a big way, and I have to say that I hate all formats except Commander. <laughs> oh, man after my own heart. As any good petition taste, as always, from Mr. Bones. Yep, and as always, I'm Noki, and this is probably the first time that I'm actually introducing myself because I'm bad at things. <laughs> it's fine. Sick. <laughs> Let's get we've some got, uh, cards, shall we've, we? Yeah, we've got an <laughs> yeah. exciting list on the docket today, folks. Yeah. Yep, so it's our usual format episode where we'll review the top cards from our custom magic. <clears throat> uh, and our first our first card is more of a concept than anything. It is an Inger album uh, just displaying the concept of conflux mana. So, with Conflux Mana, it is making purple a color of magic. Except hmm. each mana in a cost must be paid with a different color of mana. Yeah, so, so this is example, pretty interesting. Indeed. Yeah. The, it's a good idea to make it sort of like the anti Aldrazi in terms of flavor, hmm. since they are pure color, I would say. Well, did we want to read out the yeah the example card here? Because uh, we yeah. got Reality Parasite, which yeah. is a um, free free flyer for free conflux mana. So purple, 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 and it has reminder text here that each purple in a cost must be paid with a different color of mana. So, who likes shards and wedges, guys? <laughs> oh, exactly. I mean. Before we move on to discussing Conflux Mana as a whole, I, I mean, a free mana, free free flyer that requires three different colors of mana to cast? It's I mean, a common. Like, you, you could play this in a, if a set had enough fixing for it, uh, in the middle. I, I agree on that. It's, I mean, it's certainly no Mantis Rider, but yeah, what do you well, expect? It's, it's efficient as far as sounds are concerned. Also, we generally tend to uh, read the flavor text of cards. And this one oh, is, okay. This one is great, though. It has, they have existed since Dawn of Reality and will still be around to feast on the remains. Lovely. I find, yeah. I find the choice of symbol, the, the purple symbol, uh, a little confusing, considering this idea is that you have to use various flavors of magic in order to cast these spells. Um... You know, yeah. it despite them being it, it's been said they're the anti Eldrazi conceptually, right? So why are they also this kind of parasitic um, or, organism, this reality parasite? I'd say mm. that describes what an Eldrazi is, and yet uh, what what is conceptually the, the, could be the opposite of colorless creatures just seems to be falling into the same pattern. A bit of a flavor fail there, if you ask me. Well, my my I main issue that's... here. My main issue is more that uh, just like the comprehension complexity um, and the way that like uh, yeah that the mana doesn't really like play super well. Like if you have two uh, yeah two well the cascade mana like it plays like a gold card and then three is a shard. Basically, like four and five don't have a lot of difference because once you get to that mana mana, you you know as in there's not a lot of difference between four color. Uh, cards and five color cards, but the thing is, you can't have a single cascade mana on its own. Like, and there's so many different combinations that you have to think about. It just seems like overly complex. Just kind of trying to be cute as you know, design wise, uh, rather than yeah. having actually good gameplay. Like, in the in the yeah. only kind of that this that this could that this could work in, it could just be replaced with generic mana a lot of the time. Mm. It seems it seems like in actual gameplay. The effect it'll end up having is that 
it there'll probably be effects on these cards that some colors um their cards typically f find it difficult to uh, have access to so like imagine if there was a a, a burn style uh, conflux card and you're playing yeah. say, a black deck or, or rather a, a black green deck right you only have to splash another color of mana and then you, you could have access to that burn spell right and it doesn't oh, have, it, have to be yeah. you know you don't necessarily have to splash red in order to get access to that so it, yeah. it kind of weakens the, the color chart in a way the color bar, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has, a, has a whole bunch of issues. Um, also, to to me, this kind of feels like one of those throwaway mechanics they do kind of a lot. Like, let's look at, for example, like Dominera. Hey, Sag is a raw thing, whole new type of cards, and hey, Historic, it's a whole new thing, it's a whole mm. new type of uh, permanent yeah. gun right after. But I guess, but the thing, but the thing is about that is that like the gameplay of those were good, like. The gameplay yeah. this isn't good. <laughs> yeah, but what I mean is it's it's like a one set jump. It's like it's adding five new chapters to the comprehensive rules of magic. They're never gonna be used because it's a one set kind of wonder. And let, let, yeah. me, wondrous. let me ask you guys a question. Would you play a black, blue, green free free flyer in your deck? Uh in limited, I would yeah. If the fixing was good enough, uh, in mm. no other format, like, but yeah, like, because you play you play five mana free free flyers in limited all the time, and uh, yes, if, but so like, even if it's, you're, it's a, it's a restriction though. It it change it it, bleh, it slims the circumstances in which you can cast it because you always need to have access mm. to those three different kinds of mana. Yeah, yeah, but the times that you're like getting them down on turn four, like, isn't. Limited, you're unlikely to be able to cast a tricolor card on turn three. Uh, but like, time to getting it down on turn four, you're getting like a pretty reasonable advantage. Um, and then also the times when you go like play two of them at once because they're you know for six mana. Um, yeah, I so like that's in, the format would have to like heavily support it, but like I would play them, uh, you know, in the right be, deck. It would like, need to be Ravnica Signet tier. Color oh, fixing. it's Kanzataki, right? Does it need to be Kanzataki kind of style? Yeah. Like, um, but yeah, as in, I'm not not saying it would be a good design because, like the uh, the you know ceiling to floor of like you know if you get your uh, fr free colors up, you know, uh, on turn three or four compared to turn five or six is so huge. Like that's why I think. Higher con converted mana cost uh, shard cards are far better designs for commons uh, because there's a lot more leeway. You're much more likely to have the mana to cast it by the time you uh, can afford it. Um, yeah. But like, it is a playable card, but that's yeah, different to it being like actually a card that I would. I simply don't put. understand the niche this mechanic is trying to fill. What's the identity of Confluence Mana? What's yeah, it yeah. specifically meant to be doing for you? If you look in the album, you can see examples of cards that just kind of seem to have been slapped together and do sort of everything. There's one card hmm. where you can hmm. you can spend free Confluence Mana to basically gain any of the evergreen uh, keywords, for instance. <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> what's the point of that? Is it meant to be some kind of beta that you can pump with Mana? Is yeah, that anyway, the identity it, of confluence? It, 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 it just seems it, it seems messy and uh, like I said, cute, right? As in, it's you do it, you're designing it because it's a cool de like design, yeah, the, right? Not the, a these cool are all like void. Like, it's like reality parasite, void dragon. You know, it's like a... <laughs> yeah. T to me, that's a bit of a flavor fair because if it's kind of like the anti Aldrazi, like pure color, it would mm. make more sense for them to be like creators. Since Eldrazi's, their whole, what well, we assume what their mission purpose is, is to basically recycle dying mm. worlds into biomass, I guess. <laughs> we, we don't know. Anyway, uh, did we want to move on to the next card? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we've, I think we trod the ground here. Yeah. Okay, so next we have Rewrite History. And um, it's got a little it, the flavor art, as I, I've decided to call it. Uh, it's got a little reference to um, time warp in the art, 
It's one of the sort of half skeleton men putting his hand through a big prism. It's a sorcery for one colorless, one blue. And um, the text is, as an additional cost to cast rewrite history, exile five historic cards from your graveyard, which are, of course, artifacts, legendaries, and sagas. And then take an extra turn after this one. Also, it's a mythic rare. Yep. So um, it's ex- exile five, take an extra turn for two mana. So uh, it's basically, what? it's basically, it's it's basically a seven mana, seven mana thing with delve. Yeah. No way. A uh, very specific delve, like. Um, I actually, really yeah, I, I actually like think the design of this is like a lot better than the previous card, right? Because yeah, yeah. it's both, uh, you know, it's, it's both like not easy to cast early on, right? Despite the low mana cost, because of how specific the delving is here. Uh, yeah, it's okay. a powerful effect that references an old card. The art references the old card, and then it even makes flavor sense because it's historic cards fitting into rewriting of history into extra turns. I I think this makes a really nice package. Yeah. Really, the only way I can think of to play this turn two would be play a land drop, then you play one with nothing, discard your hand, <laughs> hoping it's five historic cards. Next turn, you draw... Actually, no, that doesn't work, because then you need to, like, draw a second land and rewrite history, so that doesn't work. So, yeah, no, I don't think it's actually possible to play rewrite history on second turn without seriously oh. gimping yourself. How unless possible? You, like, unless Go ahead. you, like, tone turn one, and then, and then end up somehow hitting five historic cards from milling yourself for five. How comfortable are you guys with being able to play cards that let you take extra turns. Um, um, moderation. Oh, oh, the fact that this doesn't exile itself is uh, actually a huge concern for me. I was going to say that. It doesn't exile itself. That's kind of problematic. But on its own, I think it's fine. I, I do think it adds a bit too much to Blue's kit, because the only other take an extra turn card is an artifact and like a green card. So I think maybe it should try to branch out in other colors, but other than that, I think it's a fun enough mechanic. Yeah, I, I treat extra turn cards a bit like, uh, you know, chili or something, where it's like a little bit can really make like things exciting, but uh, dump you know a whole uh, bucket of chili on something, and you're like, oh boy, this is not very fun. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, think we can like... we can compare it to a Nexus of Fate as well. Oh, um, which was which I, I was a card know. that wizards were comfortable with printing. Yeah, because uh, they are lunatics at the moment. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Next, like Nexus of Fate, uh, I think was a fine card if it was not, uh, as in, like they underestimated how uh, like strong it was, right? As in, like if it had cost like yeah. a, cup, a little bit more. I think it would have been fine. Yeah. Because like, the whole the whole like excitement of like, oh man, it's like somewhere in my deck and I could like top deck at any stage is like a uh, reasonably yeah, well, exciting way of creating recursion while also being like reasonably safe. Yeah, well I, I'm not a big fan of the fact that very easily basically just goes infinite, which I think it's kind of a design fail. Also, yeah, yeah. clearly there were fucking lunatics when they decided to make that the <laughs> promo. And I'm still thinking that Wizard of the Coast right now are absolutely gone off their fucking rockers. But yeah. So, like, aside from aside from the bashing Watsi for the mistake that we all know they made, uh, this, this yeah, just seems like a, at least it doesn't, like, infinitely recur itself. Uh, it, I, I mean, know. it... I guess I mean, you can't not have any every extra turn card card cards in your graveyard unless you're like doing crazy pull from the void things where you're getting back exiled cards. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the best yeah. part of this card will be the creative deck building required to uh, perform the yes. big with it. Yeah, the, the scary right. thing about this card is if you get to like turn four and somehow I have like 10 historic cards that you can go like one even late the game, other. You know. Late game getting an extra yeah. turn is still it's it's an incredibly potent thing at any stage. I feel like it might I feel like it might be better at the uh, I feel like extra turn effects are better in the late game because that's mm. when you have the board power to actually use it more. 
Because in the early turns, you basically just use it to play a land drop and maybe swing with a tiny flyer. Yeah, when you can use it, I mean, it's still two mana, bear in mind. So you can still use it, you can still very easily, late game, set up a big beefy board, play, ne play not Nexus of Fate, play uh, <laughs> Rewrite, Rewrite History. history. And then, you know, just swing yeah. in and your opponent yeah, has nothing I, I, sh to do. I share your power level concerns. Um, even if I ov overall like the, like, blending of mechanic and uh, flavor here. I mean, mm. this is this is pretty degenerate thinking of me, but uh, this would go great in my Metal My Super Friends deck. It's essentially extra turn tribal <laughs> with a Super Friends sub-theme. The fact that you said extra turn tribal just, like... Makes me think less of you as, as a person. <laughs> I mean, dude, have you seen the lists that the, the fucking work you need to put in to make an extra turn tribal deck not jank? <laughs> uh, why would you? You're installing the jank directly into your body. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, yeah. I think we're a lot more positive on this card uh, overall. So let's uh, move, yeah. even if yeah, even if there's some potential power level issues, let's uh, move on. So uh, this is the end. Justifies the mean. Oh no, that's the title. Uh, Woodlands Ire. It's one green green for s rare sorcery, and it says create a zero zero green tree folk creature token. With this creature gets plus one plus one for each basic forest lands card in your graveyard, and then it has retrace. And retrace for those who haven't seen the mechanic before is you may cast this card from your graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying its other costs. Very flavorful. The flavor yeah, text is. I mean, retrace well, is kind of awful. <laughs> well, the, I, th I think I think the title kind of doesn't make sense of what they're going for because this is like a, a, a self recycling card, you know, that it, mm. it kind of thrives the more you play it. So this is, I think, a missed opportunity <laughs> in terms of the title. Uh, the flavor text just is, puns. <laughs> yeah, just a lazy excuse to make a joke. So uh, yeah, my job. Ah, I just tried to make ends meet. Hilarious. <laughs> oh yeah, I love these shitty ass buns. That's why I want a banana this big. Yeah, that's amazing flavor text. But mechanically, no, yeah. yeah, mechanically, mechanically, I really am not sure how I stand on this. I like it. But because I like retrace as a mechanic, I think it's better than what they were trying to do now with jumpstart. And mm. like I know that retrace is kind of pretty busted, but I still don't think it's that busted. Now the question is, does Woodlands Iron really bust retrace? And I don't no. really think so. Cause so it's essentially this card is worm harvest without all of the things that made Worm Harvest good, albeit at a much lower cost. It doesn't go wide like Worm Harvest So, can. So Worm Harvest, for those who haven't played the card, is uh, create a 1-1 one, one black and green worm creature token for each land in your graveyard, and then has retrace. Um, for and it was two black-green hybrid, black-green hybrid, black-green hybrid. Um, I mean, I think the effect you're missing here in compar comparing to Worm Harvest is that um, it is that the buff on the treants tree folk are like passive, so all of them are getting bigger when you retrace. It's not just that the next one gets bigger. So yeah, well, that, it helps that with means tracking. I mean, sure, it helps with tracking, but as in like from a power, as in the recursion here is actually far nastier than worm harvest. Yeah, well, I, doing it like this does help on tracking issues, though, because if they all had different power levels, mm, it mm. might get oh, yeah, confusing yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. I agree, but it's just like Worm Harvest. This is cheaper than Worm Harvest. Worm Harvest was, uh, you know, you're only getting one additional power per cast because you're only getting, well, this is you're getting exponentially more power per cast. I, th I think the problem I have here is that um, green's the color which, of all the colors, is most able to um, function without lands or land access. Mm -hmm. So they can, you can, in fact, afford to discard your lands to uh, use the effect of this card. And it's not as... You you know, know. I mean, once this, once this gets big enough, like, why do I ever need to cast enough card again? Like, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, like as in once like my tree folk are like five five six sixes, like three mana six sixes where that also buff every other one of my tree folk seems great. Like mm -hmm. if you're getting like three mana, like, you know, get you know, eight, nine, ten power per turn, you know, then next time it's, you know, fourteen, fifteen power and then, you know, twenty five power and then yeah, it's like it's pretty crazy pretty quickly. But uh -huh. you know, it they don't have trample though, so they're pretty chump blockable, but it's a lot of but there's lots of them, right? Like, because you're because you're recurring, yeah. Uh, uh, you need like, a good engine. Uh, I think it. this shows the weakness of retrace, right? As in, like, from a design perspective, in that like Maybe. it's so Maybe. difficult to make retrace cards exciting because like they are so infinitely repeatable. Um, ah, yeah. Anyway, so like but this card, I like. I think the des the design problems and the power level problems are. Uh, fatally interlinked. Yeah, but that, that's true. <laughs> and you think you, we we can reach a consensus on this one? It's there, there's a lot to say either way. I'd say. Yeah, personally, I I, I kind of like it personally, at least. But yeah, I think. Yeah, I think like a lot of cards that on the custom magic forum, it's a nice card to read and then not a nice card to play. Yeah. yeah, probably would fit it in a mono green commander deck, but a lot of things well, it has, has to be mono green because, like, that that is one thing that it is basic forest lands rather than like just saying like forest or just saying like any lands, right? Because it, it yeah. would be a I, lot I, more powerful. So you I can't put it in the same deck as Worm Harvest. The biggest, oh, yeah. the biggest thing with uh, the biggest thing with custom music is like a lot of the cards are interesting, but they're not. Fun. <laughs> if I can just it, raise a point, yes, um, the first because it creates a zero zero token the first time you play it, it's a free mana do nothing the first turn unless your opponent has already milled, milled or burned one of your lands. That is yeah, well, and I'm assuming you're playing like uh, you're playing like say the Wayfarer or something on turn two, like uh, you probably I mean, build around it, but he does have is, a point. Is there any turn where you want to spend free mana to do nothing? No, but it's, it's not. Yeah, as in, yeah, like any any deck is, that has this is going to be built around it, right? And I think that is like the saving grace of this card. I uh, guess is, so. that, is that yes, it's not a very flexible card. It's just very annoying if it does work. I would like to see a deck that is built around it. I liked it. Hmm. And I wasn't around for retrace though, so I. Can't say how busted it is, but overall, I think we can all say it's all pretty interesting, at least. Yeah. Um. Now let's move on to the next card. So we have a land. This is Varagol, Last of the Titans, a legendary land with battle cry, double strike, vigilance, and tap add one colorless mana to your mana pool. Oh, just add it, see. Although well, uh, it's rarely traversed by even the most uh, intrepid of explorers, the vast, barren, and in inhospitable wilderness beyond Paliano is rife with artifacts of Fiora's earliest civilizations. Okay, so the land has keywords. Forts? Well, I'm really wondering why it has battle cry. Because the other two, you know, they're regular <laughs> vanilla keywords. <laughs> yeah. What, what set was battle cry in? Right. Uh, the battle cry was uh, Mirrodin, Mirrodin besieged. It was part of the Mirren uh, faction. Okay. Yep. Um, I can't think of any cards off the top of my head that let you turn a land into a like a token. Uh, all, all the awaken cards. Only thing with awaken. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's there's a lot of things that turn lands into creatures. Hell, Nissa. there was. <laughs> There was one in Dominaria that turns all your lands into creatures and gives them. That, that's my brain, not nature, yeah, surely. Yeah, anyway, but uh, yeah, it's like so niche, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I I do agree that like holy moly, the battle cry is like really out of place here. Uh, yeah, like, it's one of and it's not even. Seen, it's one of those cards that you'd only ever see in a commander precon. And nowhere else. <laughs> you know what? Hmm. That's fair. Also, I really don't. It's 
Also, Battle Cry isn't even that flavorful since there's only one Titan. He's not like leading the other ones into battle. They're all fucking dead. Mm. And... Well, yeah, and also just like in general, this wants you to play one human. You this wants you to make it one hum- huge thing, not a swarm. Yeah, the Battle Cry. Battle Cry is by far like the biggest. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. The, I the don't biggest. understand also... what this is, what it's aiming to achieve. Like, uh, the, Where... the these particular keywords. Why choose these ones? I think Double Strike is like the. I think the Double Strike is the key one right here. Uh, Vigilance is weird. Uh, I guess that just trample would t- make sense though, because it's a titan. Yeah. It's gigantic. Mm. One thing yeah. though that I don't that, that I'm not a fan of is that because it's a legendary land, you play one and every other Varigal is dead in your hand. <laughs> I and mean, considering that this, I mean. Because this land kind of needs some specific conditions to awaken, mm. as it were, you already aren't going to sometimes get all the value you can get out of it. So getting more, it's just... I, I think uh, Noki had it right here that this is probably more for a commander product and thus not relevant. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, I still wanted to point it out, though, because you, mm. you can put four of this in Vintage and Legacy. Don't know why you would. You can, you can put a four of a lot of bad cards in Vintage and Legacy. Yeah, that's, that's, no, that's no defense. Come on. You can put four of Squire in Vintage and Legacy. Yeah, but I think... I, I, I think this the idea of just like keywords on land is like fine if like I've seen you know many times before. Um, but this is not a particularly great execution of it. I think I'd sum this one up as. It would require a lot of uh, support to be used to its fullest, and I don't think the payoff would be worth that that support. At least not currently. Like if if it was like double strike, trample, and like indestructible or something, mm. <laughs> then you're like, oh, yeah. now this is like kind of exciting. Let's like yeah, give it something pieces. more in flavor for a titan, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you got a landfall deck that animates your lands, which is something that I've seen a couple of times, you're going to put this in. If not, you're never going to consider exporting it in a deck. Do so. do um do awaken effects tend to keep the those lands as creatures on the board? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. awaken is will put counters on the lands and the lands will permanently be zero zeros. Yeah, there's other effects like this that last for a turn. Uh, yeah, there's, such as Nissa. Um, yeah. yeah, there's one that turns all your saplings into lands and all your lands into saplings. <laughs> God damn it, freaking Ravnica. Um, that wasn't Ravnica. Yeah. That was was a uh, oh. chaos. And- oh, plant. Oh, well, even worse. Okay. Uh, <laughs> shall we, shall we move uh, on? Yeah, let, I think yep. we're straying straying a bit. Let's let's move on to yeah. um, a visitation, yeah. which is a uh, one colorless, a green, and a blue. It's an enchantment, Mm -hmm. and its text reads, If one or more creature tokens will be created under an opponent's control, that many 1-1 blue frog creature tokens are created instead. With the flavor text, Like the angels, the frogs also declined to eat any bird seed. So yeah, this is an answer to a Ravnica card, because Ravnica is coming next week. A lot of custom magic is just people being like, Ooh, Ravnica, that's inspiring and doing stuff. <laughs> Same thing happened when uh, Untable was uh, announced. Thing, but, yeah. And Same we got so many <laughs> Silver Blur Border. Uh, okay, yeah. Same thing for every set. Shouting in my head. Stony Silence. Stony. <laughs> this no, is a very it's only token, hate it's card. A, it it's, only, like. it's only token creatures. But yeah, uh, so the card this is referencing, let me just pull it up, is. Um, Oh, I cannot find it for the lot. Anyway, I think so it's called Angelic Vegetation. It's called Angelic Vegetation, I think. Basically, it's the same card, except it uh, it's only your it's tokens, and it makes 4-4 four, four Angel with flying. So this is supposed to be like, aha, now your angels are just frogs. Rule-wise, uh, I think people pointed out in the comments, it doesn't actually work, because it's two replacement effects. So... It's just you choose, and you're obviously not gonna get the frogs. You're gonna get the <laughs> yes, <laughs> yep. Divine. But I get, what it's to do. I, I get what it's trying to do, and it's kind of cute. 
and I like frogs. Who doesn't? But I don't think this would really. I mean, it holds a token dex, I guess. It doesn't you know, even really token hold de- token dex because token dex often create lots of one ones. I think this is far yeah, less what... fun than divine visitation. That's... Yeah, that's why I said one. I guess. This is like the equivalent of a Magic the Gathering diss track about suppose... some guy that did it better. Yeah. If you run, a, if you run a, if you run a, a white weenie deck in modern, then I, I guess this is the card that you don't want to see. But uh, other than that. It, it's a sideboard card, I guess, for like a very specific kind of meta. It is so specific. It's like the kind of card you would never think of, except in like one case scenario. <laughs> and even then, I'm just. Even then. Also, what's an onurin? Probably having know. something for frogs. <laughs> I, I, I kind of know the lore of Renica. I never heard of Anurin. Maybe it's. Uh, let me let me look. The type of frog. Let me look it up. Let me look it up. All right. While you Maybe. guys, uh, while I look that up, you guys uh, read out the name. So our so our next card is Seize. It is an instant and uncommon for a single white mana. Has an additional no cost to cast Seize. Tap tap two untapped creatures you control. And it says, Exile, target artifact, enchantment, or attacking creature with the flavor text of guards. <laughs> um, so, and it, just before we get on this, uh, an Anurin is a tailless amphibian of the order Anura, a frog or toad. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> All right, so it's, the, so it's the big family of uh, leapy dudes. <laughs> Leap boys. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Seize is like a pretty interesting, uh, yeah, like exile spell. Um, very efficient, right? Like uh, you cast this and you cast like um, you know, call a raise the alarm and this, and it's like woof, you've got your own path to exile. In a go yeah. deck, this is actually copied by the rate of pass. Yeah, like potentially even better. I think than someone that. saw someone saw Assassin's Trophy and they got a little carried away. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know what? Like, you might be right. Like Is it also a- it also exiles artifacts and enchantments. Good lord! Uh, like how do God sees an enchantment? Hmm. You know, you know. I don't what? know. I mean, if if I may, if, you you know what? Um, which fuck's it? I'm 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 sorry, Noki. Uh, because you lag a little bit, I can't tell if I'm talking over you, and every time I realize I do, I commit suicide. Me too. But uh, you know which color excels at creating lots of tokens that they can use to, say, tap, to cast a really powerful one mana removal? White. Yeah. You know what, though? This would... Too strong. You know, I, I could see it taking enchantments with, like, a... Uh... Card from Kaladesh was like consulate seizing or something like that. I don't know, but it's pretty neat at instant speed. I'm pretty damn certain would see modern play, maybe not in tier one decks, but probably Soul Sisters and White Weenie. And I love me some fucking White Weenie. It should have been printed in Zendikar, Canter Gideon. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I think two's the wrong number, right? Like, uh, if we look at, uh, there was a card in Rise of the Eldrazi, which was a counter spell that required you to tap three creatures. Um, or was it a draw three card? There was like an Ancestral Visions, I think, too. But yeah, like, there was a bunch of cards that required you to tap, like, lots and lots of creatures. And those were hard to make work. Right, because three cre- having three creatures is so much more difficult than having two, um, and so I think it's got just like too easier um, condition here, and just too easier condition and too wider target. Like, as in this should just be exile target creature. Yeah, creature artifact. I could get it. Enchantment. I think it's going a bit too far because <laughs> at that point you can main board this in modern and you'll be fucking fine. I mean, it, the thing the thing is, it might not go in modern all the time because it only targets attacking creatures. But then again, it still targets artifacts and enchantments. So, like, 
even if they're only playing utility creatures, they're probably also playing utility artifacts or utility enchantments with it. Yep. Um, so the card that I was talking about earlier was Shared Discovery, uh, yeah, from Rise of the Eldrazi, which was a single blue mana. To, uh, you can have to tap four untapped creatures you control to draw free cards. And so, like, Christ. yeah, the card was like bad, but the thing is, like, people try to go for it. I think, like, it's much better to make the effect super exciting. Like, you know, yeah, they could make it just like exalt any creature, mm. uh, mm. enchantment or artifact, but then like make the condition actually a proper condition. I think it's it's too efficient for an exile. Um, you mm-hmm. could maybe you could maybe tone this down, make it just destroy. Or make you have to tap more creatures or pay more mana, but th- this is far too efficient and far too wide. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, the numbers. The, I think the yeah. the idea is okay. The numbers are wrong, uh, and that's <laughs> like you know something that's a, a good thing to be able to recognize as a designer. When, I guess the like, flavor is that it's two guards in the art dragging the yeah, guy away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't 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 build the art basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this uh, would yeah this would probably be better as like. If this was the exact same card, except it was an enchantment that exiled until the enchantment leaves, basically a better O-ring, I would be happier with it. And it would mm. probably make more sense. Yeah, you could do like an, o- an O-ring with... But yeah, anyway, it's... In any case, yeah, the numbers are wrong. It's too efficient. Like, the idea is okay. Um, yeah. Let's move on to a saga... So this is Journey to the oh, West. <laughs> yep. So Journey right. to the West. One and a green as the saga enters and after your draw step at a law counter, sacrifice after three. Uh, so number one, is, chapter one is search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. So it's Lay of the Land. And then two and three are you may play an additional land this turn. Um, so-, so this is like... Pretty low impact, but like also low cost. Inter- mm. Interesting saga, like uh, subdued for a custom design, yeah. which I appreciate. This is, this is more of a workhorse kind of uh, uncommon that's probably gonna help you out if you're playing like green stompy in some kind of standard deck. Of course, the flavor is nice, it's based on the uh, very historically uh, significant. Uh, Japanese manga Journey to the West. <laughs> yeah, well, I believe this is. I believe this and the next card we're going to be talking about are. Um, I don't see how the effects tie into Journey to the West as a story. Yeah, <laughs> I think they just well, slap that name. That name on. Yeah, uh, this one and the next one are both uh, based around Japanese sagas, at least name and flavor wise, uh, though not so much mechanically. Hmm. Yeah, well, I playing extra lands is. Sp- Called the explore effect, but in the story they don't really explore. They kind of know exactly where they need to go. Well, but I mean, he does kind of know exactly where he needs to go because he's already searched the land that he's going to. I don't know. I feel like it kind of works. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess. It's it's like actually like more powerful than you might expect, just because it's like rampant growth is a really powerful card, and this kind of gives yeah, rampant well, growth. Yeah, I never said it was bad because this. Hmm. I mean, you don't. You're not always going to be able to play an additional land on the third chapter, hmm. and it can always be disrupted. Don't know why you would disrupt this if you got it instead of keeping it for something better. So, I think this I, would I, be play. I think this is kind of weak, uh, to be honest. I think the third chapter oh. should be something else because you probably, like you said, you it's kind of unlikely that you'll have enough lands to play well, and, and to well, take Mr. advantage Brent, of defense. Do you consider rampant growth a strong card? Uh, because like I've... rampant growth, uh, I want to note like what's he has said that they consider the card too strong for standard. Like whether you agree with that or not, like is up yeah. is up to yeah, you. I but see, like I, I this this from. this is. Essentially, rampant growth, uh, because the turn after you play it, you come out with you know a land ahead, right? Untapped. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, well let, let, let me put it this way it's weak in this instance because at that point, you're unlikely to have another land to take advantage of that effect. But if you do have a land, 
to to play, then I guess it is it's really still too good. strong. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. really yeah. you both buff and nerf the card if you made that third chapter maybe something more in flavor with Journey to the West. You, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I do like how clean two chapter uh, je- sagas are. Like, mm. the- yeah, it's it's clean. It's good. It's efficient. It's not that flavorful, but I mean, it's 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 a ram card. I can't really be all animated about it. It's <laughs> would I play it? I in a landfall deck. This thing kicks ass. <laughs> that much. <laughs> Um, yeah, like this. This is pretty interesting. Um, like, I think this is one of the cards where it looks. It's actually a lot stronger than look. Uh, yeah, um, I could, I could because make me look stronger in a lot of sets. So, what was that, Noki? I could, I could honestly see this being a rare because it's rampant growth with a fairly relevant upside in mm. some cases. Of course, you maybe you're right. <laughs> like, what if it just didn't have the third chapter? <laughs> uh, no, I'll like... say that. If this was a rare, this would be the kind of rare that pissed me off because I was asking. Yeah, no, no, no. I think, I think it's keeping it as uncommon and keeping the elegance is like pretty important. Um, I don't know. It's it's interesting because like it's hard to disrupt because. Like even though it's an enchantment that's interactable and like a rampant growth, it is like you're getting the land straight away, right? Mm. So you're kind of getting your back your card advantage. Um, I'd say tool just tool around with that third chapter. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and it needs some minor tweaks, but I, I think this is like one of the closest cards to like just uh, overall like good design that we've had uh, so mm. far. Um, yeah, so- sometimes we get good ones. Sometimes we basically get. Concepts that are resonating <laughs> enough to get upvoted. If if you had to create a ramp saga, uh, and and I mean, God has forsaken you if you have to do such a thing, then uh, <laughs> this this is more or less what it would look like. Hmm. That's yeah. fair. That's fair. Shall we? Minute. Shall we skitter on? Yes, yep. we shall. So, <laughs> yep. So the next card is uh, leaping the dragon gate. It is a blue rare. It's another saga. It costs one blue mana. Uh, the first chapter is create a 1-1 one, one blue fish creature token. The second part is target creature controls gains flying until end of turn. And the final part is exile a fish you control. If you do, create a 4-4 red dragon creature token with flying. Of course, this saga is inspired from the uh, story that if a carp manages to go up a certain river where they put like a temple on top it's going to turn into a dragon mm-hmm. or maybe a nice meal i really don't remember yeah um this is i kind of really like this because it is like obviously like a very powerful payoff like if you have you know a 4/4 dragon on turn 4 that's like pretty good but it's so easy to disrupt right both you can yeah, kill the good. you can both kill the fish or you can kill the enchantment and like i really like these kind of like uh high high risk high reward cards um yeah, yeah i mean it, it, this is very difficult for me to judge because like a lot of times they're just gonna ping your one one and then Oh, I guess I don't get anything for the next. But they have to ping. But like the scary thing is, they have to ping your one one, and like you know, so early in the game, and uh, it's interesting. But also, you can do things like if you have a second leap the dragon gate, you can play leap the dragon gate like directly afterwards if they uh, to make another fish because you don't have to target. You don't have to exile the fish that like. that got created by that card. It can be any fish. Yeah, so, so if uh, you're playing Sea Creatures Tribal... <laughs> yeah, Mer- Merfolk is. can actually be Fish As Tribal now, rather than Merfolk Tribal. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. no, there there is a couple of fishes in Magic, you know, as know. well as uh, Squids and Leviathans and all these things that really should be one single tribe, but no, no, that's no, a no, whole... That's another thing entirely. This guy, it's pretty good, but I don't really like the payoff that much. Because what you get at the end is just an efficient flyer. It's 
Fifth. You don't find you, you don't find that exciting. I find that pretty exciting as a. Uh, as I a mean, at, Tammy. <laughs> I mean, I guess. But turn five, you get you end up with a four four flyer that can. Attack. It's not turn five. It's turn three. Yeah. 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 No. Sorry. I turn four. You can attack <laughs> with a four four flyer. It's all right. It's not horrible. And it's certainly good and playable, but it's certainly not a saga that's going to rock my socks off or going to be like, oh, man, I can combo <laughs> this with this, and I can fucking play Progenitus on turn two. It's definitely not this kind of card. And as, you, I, as we can clearly see, it appeals to a certain type of people. And if you're playing a dragon deck, I guess you can play this and end up with a nice 4-4 mm -hmm. dragon. And I feel like we're also not talking about the second chapter much. Well, sure. the second chapter is very low impact on turn yeah. two. But yeah, you're right that like it is possible that like if you're playing some sort of like blue green stompy deck, you could actually like play this more for the second chapter. Yeah, because one blue next turn something you have gets flying that can. Uh, well, anything okay. can end games, but it can really swing the game in your part. Well, it's more that, yeah, that like it's doing that as well as also threatening the four four, right? I, like, I think all I can, all you can say, I think the best thing I could say for this one is that it's good on turn one, pretty good. Um, but there's not really any other turn where it's a great play. It is only one blue, so you can just yeah. drop it. Um, you know, when you just have some extra mana floating around, but yeah, it's a very, it's kind of lowish impact, but it's also very low. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a low commitment card. Mm -hmm. um, low yeah, no, I, I, mediocre. I, I, I'm... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I quite enjoy this, and I think it does a far better job than the previous card, at, like uh, showcasing the Japanese saga. Like the actual like story. Yeah, I, I agree. No, that's fair. Well, the second chapter is clearly just they run out of ideas. No, no, the yeah. second chapter is it's going up the uh, up the river, right? Like, it's, yeah, it's sleeping the whole, the whole over. Thing, it. Yeah, the whole I, thing I guess is, so. that, is it just that, takes yeah, to the, the sky as it's swimming. Oh, well, hasn't have you seen like salmon and stuff like going upstream? They basically like yeah. you know make these huge leaps up waterfalls and stuff. It's crazy. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, because oh, wow. the legend said I think it, it needs to like go over a waterfall. Might as well be flying yeah. at that point. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, I've got to head off, guys. But uh, thank you for uh, having me on the show. Um, yeah, if... thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, before I go, I'm just going to like plug the Kickstarter for my game, which uh, I'm working on, uh, which is Infinity Heroes. Uh, go check us out. Um, I'm sure uh, we'll have a link in the show notes or something. Yep, I'll probably Beans. put a link in the description if I can remember. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks for having me, and uh, this has been a bit of fun. Take care, buddy. Bye. Also, we are not sponsored by uh, the Kickstarter or the people behind the Kickstarter. We are now. And we can demand money for it. Dude, we can get stacked rich. Going to be this able to a, be like This is a wonderful business opportunity. I'm going to be able to buy like one red flavored Mountain Dew with all the money. You could be able to buy the uh, the the Master's Planeswalker box. You going to get that Timmy box, man. Oh god, that don't get me started on this or I'm going to be fucking ranting again. <laughs> All right, that, we'll save that for another podcast. But now you've seen those you've seen those Mikio rants. They're fucking horrible. I hate them. <laughs> I've I've seen the rants. Um, okay, so next we have Grick Skyrider for one colorless and two red. He is a legendary creature, a goblin knight, and he has the partner keyword. So partner, you can have two commanders if both of them have partner. He's clearly intended to be a commander card. He has the kind of commander border. At the top. Um, here's the text. Oh, that's just being legendary, actually. Oh, is it? <laughs> oh. Yeah, shows about China. Uh, at the start of the game, if Grick is your only commander, choose a non legendary dragon creature card in your deck and put it in the command zone. That card becomes legendary and gains partner. Dragons you control have haste, and you can tap him, and he Grick deals two damage to any target. 
activate this ability only if you control a dragon. So I'm going to say this first. This guy is fucking amazing. I love his design. Yeah. He's a, he's a goblin riding a drake. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. I, I like having things that screw around with commander stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, this clearly does that. It messes with not only the command zone with partner, but it messes with the command zone as in you can have legendary creatures be your commander. Yeah. Now it's, yeah. I can feel my brain expanding rapidly as I consider all the dragons that I want to partner with this guy. Yeah, not only that, but you can make like a dragon tribal deck or whatever, or you can also fill your deck with like two or three different dragons that you can basically s- sideboard into once you see what everybody else is playing. But here's here's the thing. When you search up a dragon, does it have to be a mono-red one? Yes, because at that point you already have the deck built, meaning that it can only be mono-red. Or artifact, Mm. I suppose. Oh. Strange. That's a good point. Well, Like, that has to do it. Yeah, well, artifact that doesn't have color symbols, you know, how commander identities work. Yeah, that that does... uh, Hmm. That, that, That limits things. I hadn't really considered that. Yeah, you can do some fucking. You can do some good big brain plays or combo with this, and giving dragons haste is pretty damn good. Also. Yeah, as a, as an aura, that's uh, that, yeah. Your dragons are often going to be you know big meaty lads, so you want them at, to come out swinging the the turn you cast them. Yeah. You can also do some. Uh, I, I've looked at it before, and you can also do some cheeky stuff. If you pick Voracious Dragons, which has Devour and deals damage equals the number of goblins it devoured. Oh, dear. Oh, I, I see where this is going. Yes. Because Grick is indeed a goblin. <laughs> a goblin. That's, that's, that's so stupid, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, his ability to ping for two... Is not to be under uh, under evaluated, I would say, because any kind of pinger can be really good, and a pinger for two, that can be even in commander where live totals are pretty big, that can get quite nasty in terms of pinging. Mm-hmm. And like, don't don't forget that you can also you can also shock their creatures, right? right? Oh yeah, it's any target, so you can also hit planeswalkers too. For uh, structures, cough, 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 ha, ha, reference. I feel like it hurt you to say that. Huh? I mean, Noki's always kind of in a state of pain, so... Indeed I am. Okay, um... And like... This guy, if he ever falls off the dragon thing. So yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, there's also the fact that he does have partners. So if you don't want like a dragon in your deck, you can get some other partner to go with him. Now, I don't really know what would fit well. But considering there's dragons in around every color, you can get extremely creative and extremely open with this guy, and this is the guy, the kind of commander I love. Someone that you can just really get creative with and do a, a whole bunch of different deck archetypes with. Yeah, this guy would work with Bruce Tarl. Yeah, I was thinking of Bruce Tarl. He's just r- really solid, really creative. Uh, he's got great flavor, great mechanics, good commander. Yeah, and some nice art too. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't be upset if this got printed. Me neither. I don't yeah. think that very many people would. I think we have a... Uh... Except for maybe the Johnnies that hoped that it could fetch up any dragon. <laughs> yeah, well... If you could, it would be a bit... Um, That's an, insane. Yeah, if... Anyway. I think we have one more card to, uh, to bicker and bitch over. 
Yep. So our so our last card possibly is a blood pact. It is X and double red for an instant at rare, and it says promise the top X cards of your library, and to promise a card, exile it face down. As long as that card is exiled, its owner may look at it and play it. As you cast a spell that wasn't promised, put all promised cards you own into your graveyard. I've, I've seen that card before, and I absolutely love Promise as a mechanic for red. Oh, it, it feels red. It feels red as hell. I hate this. I hate it. I hate the mechanic. I'm, I'm, I'm Why do you just, hate it? I'm kind of just wrapping my head around it, you know? I don't know. It's. I don't. I just. I don't know what it is. I just don't like. I just don't like it. It's a. It's finally like a flavorful way in the flavor file for red to get some good, serious card advantage. That's not just drawing cards. Honestly, if promise became like an evergreen mechanic, I wouldn't be sad. Yeah, I feel like I feel like it. I feel like it tries way too hard to be cute. Like it, it's basically giving you a second hand, but once you use your first one, your second hand is gone forever. I just don't like it mechanically. Personally, it, it, I it, like it. It feels red. It's just I, I don't know. It kind of feels like a it's like it's like a control red card. This is probably a card you play in um, several in in the card it, bleh, in a deck which is uh, several colors, um, or like mono mono red burn, just to give give them a bunch of gas. Yeah, yeah, that that too. Yeah, in a burn, as I said, the main thing that red has trouble with is card advantage. This is true in standard, in modern, I think maybe not that much, and especially in no. commander. Promise, as a mechanic, I think could fix at least the whole red slash borrows doesn't have any card advantage meme that's in Commander. Like, that's the whole point of being in red. Like, red isn't supposed to get card advantage because it doesn't feel red. Of course, this is the most red way that you can do it. That's exactly. Like, at least I'll draw a thing. Like, it's... It's just an extension of all the things they've been doing recently. Of uh, I think they call it Impulse Draw. This is like Impulse Hand. It's amazing. It's great. It's flavorful. And it goes to the graveyard, so it fuels graveyard shenanigans as well. I guess so. I, I don't... I feel like it makes red... I, I, I don't know... Many uh, options. I don't know how often like a, a burn deck is going to have the opportunity to dump a lot of mana into this card to get a lot of draw out of it. Um, as strange as that sounds. Um, I suppose it gives you something to do on your later turns when you have run out of gas. I don't know. I'm kind of in two... I'm kind of, I feel like I'm between you, the, the two of you in terms of opinion. I'm kind of cool on this. Like, this, this card would be like giving, giving mono blue Three ones for two with haste, in my opinion. Like that's not that's not a thing that they do. Hmm. I don't know. I like it. I will say though, one negative thing: uh, the flavor for Blood Pact is kind of nonsensical. I feel for Red. Yeah, like when demonic, you think... demonic kind of bargains. When you think and... of Blood Pact, do you think? Either paying life or the color black. Like, how, how does yeah. how does red come into any of this? Yeah, what if it was a red black spell instead of red red? Yeah, that would make a lot more sense. But then it would serve no purpose because black has enough card advantage as it is, and promise doesn't really work with black's identity that much. Person, I think it's mostly the name and art that don't really make sense. Like promise, I that's a flavorful enough name for what it does. But red like 
goes away and ruins the ruins the flavor. Yeah, like red. The... Yeah, red does have like packs and stuff with devils, but this doesn't feel like a devilish card. It feels demonic. If it was more like devil-like, then yeah, it would make sense, but it doesn't. I think I think. I think we shouldn't look so much as about the flavor because you know you could easily rename it to something like you know devilish deal or something like that, some glib name that would make yeah. it a little clear what's going on. Yeah, you could you can uh, make I a flavor that make... you're like um you know you're 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 burning something up kind of or like temporarily stoking the flames something like that. Yeah, well, I did want to make an aside to mention the flavor of it. How dare you! Well, um, you know, I, I am nothing but Darren. So I should, I should probably go now. Uh, so if Mr. Bones and Mikio would like to continue going on, then that is perfectly fine with me. Uh, Thank, uh, thanks for coming on board, John. Yeah, of course. And I hope, I hope to talk with you all again at some point. Yeah, I'm sure I'll stick around. Just, I just need to hang up on Discord. Goodbye, everyone. Bye bye. Well, oh, this is an odd that. turn of events. I was not expecting. <laughs> Welcome to the Bones yeah. Mickey Show. So it's only me and a skeleton now. All right. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of funny because we were we were fairly close to closing out the show. I'm fairly sure. Unless you have yeah, one well, last card up your sleeve. Uh, not really. I think Blood Pact is a good place to end it. Mm. I think this is so, one where you'd have to retool the flavor as the final estimation, but I do like the idea of giving Red some conditional draw, and the cost does seem fair for the effect it gives. Yeah, it, it's basically impulse draw, but it comes with a good enough downside that you can package it enough for Red to actually get card advantage. Yeah, it's your, it's your late game second wind in a burn deck. Yeah, well, we've only seen one card with promise, so I I feel like this is a mechanic that maybe needs more complex examples to see what the designer really wants to get at with the mechanic. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that about draws it to an end, Mickey. We've lost yep. a lot of friends along the way, but. Yep. Uh, I think we've we've really dug deep into the custom card community. Yep. So if you guys have any comments, you can post them in the comment section. Don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, smash that motherfucking bell. Yeah, just just take the bell and uh, put it in your backyard. Maybe put some bird seed in it. Get some nice uh, <laughs> get some nice dandelions around it. You know, make it look nice. Make it start to choir. Make it, make it yours. Go to church. Brush your teeth. And uh, Eat greens. We'll see you, people, next week, probably. I'm trying to do this weekly. Uh, Noki was kind of under the weather next last week, and so was I, so kind of skipped that. But, you know, if you guys have any suggestions or, uh, you know, criticisms, send them it, send it our way. I'm always trying to improve the podcast. Uh, if you guys want us to do anything specific, like take a legendary we've talked about and make deck decks around it, tell us. I'll be happy to do those. Uh, you got anything to plug, Bones? Um, my thumbs into my ears after listening to this drivel. Nice. <laughs> Stay out of trouble, everyone. So yeah, have a good night.